Have we heard from Arlene or Doug? What's that? Have we heard from Arlene or Doug? Arlene gets off at five. She'll be here as soon as she can. I have not heard from Doug. Okay. Okay, we're ready. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I know board member Anderson is on her way. She gets off at five. We have not heard from board member Barker. We will excuse uh, President Zundel this evening as she's dealing with family issue. But welcome everyone to our study session for April. First, no kidding. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's just did were you gonna do something first? Nope, or, I'll just so we'll go ahead and turn time over to the superintendent to talk about the uh, recognition for community nursing services. Excellent. Thank you, Vice President uh, Wilson. I'd like to invite uh, Kathy, Talia, and Laura, Laria, if they wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is up here. All right. Um, Vice President uh, Wilson, Board of Education, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, three of the nurses uh, that have been so instrumental. I better speak where the microphone is. So instrumental in um, providing for the employees of the Ogden School District uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, as, we, uh, as we first embarked on this, it was like, oh my goodness, we had a short time frame and the setup of it was just critical. And we are, are so uh, immensely grateful for community nursing services. And we have representatives from community nursing services here with us. And we'd like to present them. Hour. And a plaque uh, commemorating uh, the services they provided for our employees. Has presented the community nursing services in appreciation of your services administering the COVID-19 vaccine to employees of the Ogden School District, January to March 2021. We'll present that also. You know who's going to take it? You know who's going to take it? Um, as far as uh, just the um, overall scope of the work, uh, we had about 1,500 employees altogether receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, that's 3,000 doses between first and second uh, administrations. And they were able to come in so professional. I, if I'm being vulnerable, really don't like needles. <laughs> and they made it painless for me. Uh, and, and I was not so brave. But uh, uh, we were just super appreciative of, of them and the work that they're doing, not only in the Ogden School District, but uh, across our community. Uh, it's just an invaluable resource, and we just can be more thrilled and appreciative of uh, how this all uh, came to be. And the, the organization of it uh, was just flawless. Would be remiss, too, also, if I didn't recognize our Human Resources Department, uh, who provide the staff. Uh, to set up the conditions, our custodial staff to make sure all the tables and chairs were exactly where they needed to be. Uh, really a team effort and couldn't be more grateful for a, for a partnership like this with Community Nursing Services. Thank you, Monty. I sure appreciate all of you. Please extend our um, uh, gratitude to those who also have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and thank you, ladies. Uh, often the superintendent would report, give us reports as to all the work that you're doing. And um, I'll go back to when I worked for the Department of the Navy. You sounds like you did yeoman's work. And uh, so thank you very much for all that you did for the district. Hey. Um, now we'll turn some time over to Ken Crawford and Chris Karchner for a report on our bomb projects. <clears throat> Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Vice President. Can you guys see the yes. presentation on the screen? Okay, great, thank you. So this is an awesome picture. This is the new signage that has been added to both the north and the south entrances to the Ben Lomond High School Athletic Center. Um, we couldn't apply, we couldn't adhere it to the building earlier because it needed to warm up a little bit to be able to do that. But it is very eye popping and really adds to the facility. We are looking to put another one on the east side so that as you drive along Harrison, um, you'll have that same branding out there as well but it really adds to that exterior look of the building. So that's what you're, you're looking at there. Just as we scroll down, you can see the very large dirt lot with a couple of small uh, buildings there that are, that are going up. So what you are looking at, the larger one on the left, oh, let me, there we go, I'll try and zoom in a little bit. The larger one on the left, that will be a new concessions building, a scoring tower for the softball field, and then also some storage for the custodial department. And then these two smaller ones, those are the dugouts for the softball field. And so they are busy working on that. If you've been by Ogden High in the last, sorry, Ben Loman High, not Ogden High, you can go by there, but you won't see much uh, in terms of construction. But at Ben Loman High, they have torn up the tennis courts and have started hauling that away. There's still some of that left. Um, AK Masonry is, is honing some of the block now and getting that taken care of. They've started flying in some of the steel to uh, provide the support beams for these concession, the concession building and for the dugouts. And um, I believe they were supposed to start doing some fencing, but I don't, I don't think they were able to with some of the weather. So I think that's been delayed a little bit, but they are continuing to work all of the ground for both the softball and soccer fields. And then also working the area where the tennis courts have been removed and the new ones will be going in. So a lot of earthwork going on out there. It is kind of nice. You can actually see from uh, Monroe Boulevard over to the swimming pool and, and new facility now because the large mounds of dirt have been removed. But that's what's going on at Ben Loman right now. Are there any questions that I can answer for you at this time? I guess not. Okay. Well, if not, then I will turn the time over to Chris Karsner with BDK to give us a report on our other projects that fall under the bond project. Okay. Can you see the board report on the screen? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Nye and staff. Grateful for the opportunity to give you an update on the bond program projects. Uh, <clears throat> as we've done in the past, we wanted you to know that we're working very strongly and, and diligently on ensuring that the COVID-19 pandemic stuff minimizes, uh, we minimize the impact on the projects. Uh, we still, even though fortunately vaccines are on the rise, we are still uh, requiring the mandates for the masks for all personnel interacting with the district. Uh, all of our meetings with the owners and architects staff are online meetings. Um, and so we are still continuing with all those practices. Uh, at the time that I did this report about a week and a half ago, we weren't showing any impacts on materials and supply chains. Uh, manpower on site has been excellent. However, within the last week or so, we have been notified of some potential impacts. Fortunately, because of uh, kind of our mitigation efforts to date, we don't see any impacts on the site, but as a whole in the industry, uh, materials are becoming very scarce in deer, uh, steel, wood, and as we were just notified two, two days ago, cement powder 
are all very difficult to obtain. Uh, fortunately, most of our projects, uh, at least from a procurement standpoint, are past most of these impacts. Uh, on the cement powder, we're just gonna have to be very careful and plan way in advance in order to get those orders so we fall within the quotas that are being done. And this is a nationwide industry um, impact. So I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago where the uh, steel manufacturer notified uh, several of the builders in the area that they're gonna produce about 1.2 million tons of steel next year. And Amazon had purchased 480,000 ton of those tons. So it's a, it's not just a pandemic problem, it's, it's a supply chain issue because uh, everyone loves Amazon. So <laughs> think about that next time you make a purchase. So anyway, uh, moving forward, Eastridge Elementary, uh, we're coming down to the wire. We have a couple months before substantial completion on the building. Uh, at which point the old building, once school gets out, will be demolished and the new playground put in on that end. But the, the, build, the new building itself is going rather quickly. Uh, you see a lot of finishes, paint, tile, wall, flooring uh, is actually carpet installation has started. Uh, the site work preparation for the parking lot and drop off areas to be um, paved. Uh, the final grids and other things are being installed right now. So it's really starting to look like a school. Uh, here you can see the front entrance of the school there on the left and the multipurpose room on the right. And you can see the grading that's being gone on for all of the paving that's gonna be going on in this area. Um, the back side of the building where they're power washing and cleaning the brick and preparing all the grades as well for the parking lots and, and uh, picture on the right kind of gives you a good idea where the bus drop off will be into that side entrance there. Uh, some of the landscaping rock along the east edge and then the picture on the right you could see where they're putting in the final louvers from the mechanical equipment um, that allows that mechanical equipment to breathe and such. Uh, here's a couple pictures of the multi-purpose room, the gymnasium on the inside. Excuse the fuzzy picture on the right, but that was the best one I had of the stage area. You can see some of the finishes putting in, the light fixtures and other areas that are going in. Uh, here's a picture in the classroom wing of what we call the think tank or the small breakout rooms. Uh, there, the board material you see better on the right-hand picture um, that's an entire, the entire wall is basically whiteboard material. So yeah, it's a uh, pretty neat stuff. Here's a picture of it in the classroom with the magnetic wall uh, coloration at the top. Uh, that's where the teacher can put up different items, no more pins. This will all be magnetic uh, that they can decorate the classroom and put their visual aids on. And then the rest of the room you see is covered in those whiteboard materials. Picture on the left, you can see the storage cubbies up above and then the individual student cubbies for books and backpacks. And down below is a, is a rack for boots and such. Here you can see the kitchen equipment is being installed. And then the picture on the right is the serving line. Uh, so a lot of stainless steel being installed right now and the kitchen will be up and running here shortly. Uh, switching over to Polk Elementary, um, masonry is continuing on all parts of the new building. Uh, moving over to the east side, the shot crease is completed in the old building with a new roof on, uh, no more open air. Uh, the next, the new building next for steel and deck poured, getting ready to install the roof deck. Actually, that was as of a week and a half ago. I was out there today watching him put the roof steel on the south end of the building, and the roof deck will be over the next few days. Um, framing on the insides, it said ready for slab on the footings foundation on the kitchen. That slab was actually poured yesterday. So I, I give these reports to, in, to meet the board deadlines, but uh, we're, as, as you'll see from the pictures and you drive by, you'll say, hey, we're a lot further along than that. So, which is really good. Um, storm tra drains have been tied into the city facilities and right now we're prepping for parking lots and drop off lanes. 
a lot of paving is going to go on the second those plants opened up. So the picture on the right you could see was from last month from the snow and such. And if you look at that picture on the left, that was a picture of about a week and a half ago. That wall where that scaffolding in is in now is all the way up, complete uh, the same height as that wall in the back. And I guess that they're swinging steel even today. Uh, here's a good look from the roof of the old building into what will be uh, that picture on the left kind of gives you a picture of where the gymnasium and multi-purpose room is going to be in the kitchen is where all of the plumbing is on the back side of it there. Here you can see all the underground plumbing uh, being installed for the kitchen. It takes a lot of things to make a school kitchen work. Here's a picture of the old roof uh, building and then the picture on the right you can see the classroom wings topped out completely. Uh, so those are the classroom stories from the west side facing it. And here you can see that the new roof is completely installed in the uh, old building. And then this would be on the third floor. Uh, got the new flooring underlayment down over the old floors. Uh, so it won't be Creek City. For those of you uh, like Nancy, who spent a lot of times walking on creaky floors in that old building. Um, they've now been silenced. So you'll have to wait another 80 years or so in order to walk in there and have creaky floors again. And you can see we've already put in some of the roof drains and some of the duct work and all of the new trusses in that location. Here's a, another picture from the classroom wing. Uh, next floor up, you can see we're moving right along with getting all of the duct work and fire pipe and data connections and stuff in the new classroom rings. Looks just like it did on the bottom floor, except we're now another floor higher. And by the end of the month, we'll be into the third floor. T.O. Smith, now this is the one that everyone's been looking at. Uh, Chris has been showing you a lot of uh, floors and eventually this will look like a building. So I hope that you'll be a little bit excited to see some of the pictures now. Uh, the masonry walls are going up quite a bit. Slabs are still finishing out on the west end of the building, but we've actually got structural steel up as well. So going from a pictures of a few door frames last month, that picture on the right was the picture I showed from the board meeting last uh, last month, the picture on the left was taken uh, a week ago. So you could see that a lot of the walls, especially on the kindergarten and pre-K wing are already actually up and structural steel is in. You could see the large pile of door frames waiting to be installed and going all the way down the corridors and hallway and the upper windows are actually starting to be framed out as well. So a tremendous amount of progress at T.O. Smith. Things are, are moving very rapidly. Um, the kitchen actually, they're getting ready to pour that slab as well. Um, this is out on the very west end of the building. And then we'll have most of the, all the slabs poured for the building and the masons are ready to move right out onto it. Um, expect sometime in the next couple of months for the masonry to be completely topped out in structural steel. So they're moving very quickly on T.O. Smith. So some pictures from the meetings uh, that you've already voted on in terms of color selections and stuff that were passed on to the design team. And uh, as you guys discussed last month, uh, changing whether to change the name or not or whatever uh, really probably won't impact us for a couple more months yet to go, but getting the colors and everything so we can make sure and get the orders ready. We're moving ahead on that based upon the last direction. So a couple Hall of Fame moments. Um, it's always fun to see uh, the picture on the left. The significance of that tree is that old pine tree in the corner was surrounded by some what people referred to as junk trees or trash trees. They were a type of species that actually isn't very friendly. And they were 
when we first took over the property, they were actually killing that pine tree. Um, since those trees have been removed uh, the last year plus, that pine tree has really started regenerating and uh, it's looking a lot healthier than it has. The arborist has been out there taking care of it. So that's kind of exciting to see that tree kind of revive as those other trees were removed. Um, the, the middle picture, I know it may or may not look like a tree for you artist types. You probably like, of course, that's a tree. Um, so that's the, the Art Deco finial representing a tree. Um, you may or may not have been around the site. You know that at one point in time, I believe there was about 18 of those on the crown of the old building. This, this is the last one. This is the last man standing, so to speak. Um, all of the ones that were either broken or uh, were going to be replacing with, with uh, replicas, but this is the last one that's still in the original condition up there. And then the last picture on the right was just living proof that even contractors have senses of humor. Uh, when they were doing the end bed, they couldn't resist putting a smiley face <laughs> on, on the end of it. Uh, that, don't worry, that's not the finished product. We're putting a, a facade, putting a facade of masonry over the t over the front of that. But I figured it was worth a capture before it was entombed. Uh, so anyway, are there any questions on the project uh, on the bond program projects? No, that middle picture, Chris. I thought that was a student that was told to get out of the cement. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very stylized representation of a tree, or so I've been told. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Any questions for Chris or Ken? Okay, thank you. Now, time for committee reports. Doug, do you have any, have you mapped budget and finance? I met with Zane for a while, but uh, we do. You want that now? Yeah. Well, the only thing we talked about is something that's upcoming that we probably need to be aware of, uh, and that's with the UTA uh, doing some encroachment, if you will, on uh, three of our schools. And uh, I'll let Zane talk more about it. He, I think he was going to show a, a PowerPoint to it type deal and show some pictures. He could address it a lot better than I could, but they have the domain, so they're able to take that line, you know, what they need to do, what they're going to do. So, so Zane, take it away. So, I'm going to share something for you to see, but so UTA is putting in a new BART line, rapid transit mm -hmm. line from the front of our station to uh, Weaver State University. And they're going to be going by a few of our properties, including James oh, Madison. Your, your mic. Oh, Do I need to start over? Uh, so UTA, UTA is putting in this new BART transit line, and uh, they're going to be going by James Madison, Ogden High, and Mount Ogden Junior High. And we've been put on notice that they... Uh, need to exercise their eminent domain rights and uh, basically uh, purchase from us uh, some easements. And we got notice the other day on the first one, which is at Mount Ogden Junior High, and I wanted to show you um, what we're talking about, if I can share my screen. So you can all see this. So, so this is Mount Ogden Junior High. Hope you can see my arrow. Yeah, there it is. Anyway. That's Mount Ogden Junior High. And in front there, you can see this black, dark strip. Uh, that's the easement, what they're going to be 
purchasing from us. What they're really not going to be affecting anything as far as our parking lot goes. This uh, you'll notice. I don't. You don't see it very well, but there's that little jag right there where I'm playing around with my mouse. Uh, they're going to be moving a water meter into the parking lot, so they're going to have to dig a hole, move a meter. They'll be covering it up, so we won't lose a parking space there. Uh, but they basically need that easement to move that parking meter. And then over here on the corner of Harrison uh, Boulevard and 32nd Street, they're going to be taking out those three big trees right there. Um, and putting in a new signal light and stuff, curb and gutter around there. So uh, it's one of those deals where um, we don't have to like it. We just have to live with it. So are we losing sidewalk there? So I don't think we'll be losing any sidewalk. If they do, they'll have to they'll they'll fix that. But they did tell me that they figure they're going to have to take those trees out. And they they will be sending out someone to appraise the value of this strip that they're talking about and this property, uh, and they will uh, give us some money. And if we want to take that money and uh, replace trees or something like that, that basically becomes on us to choose whether or not we do that. And um, I don't expect to see a lot of money out of this, but maybe we'll get enough that we could buy a few trees and we could put back in there if it's not going to be a problem with them. But at this point, they have that easement, so we'll have to work with them on that. Uh, we have to give them basically sign something that says that they're, they're good to proceed and... Um, We'll uh, get that sent to them. Is Effectively, it Harrison Boulevard a state road anyway? Uh, or is it yeah. not? I don't know that Harrison is. I thought Harrison Washington, Washington is 89. Were all, were all state uh, roads. Maybe they are. I don't know. All I know is UTA uh, has the eminent domain rights. And yeah. Really, so but they're going to pay. Let's not tell them it's state. <laughs> So uh, we've got a document signed that says that the board is good to go ahead and do this. And uh, we'll be sending that. But I just wanted you guys to be aware because probably this summer sometime they'll start work on this and want to just as an FYI for you to know. So Thanks. Yeah. Just as I'm trying to read your map, is like the front room, we right down the middle of that with the line with the hash marks in it is? So the BART transit, that line goes right up the middle of the street, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. And we, we, we expect similar notification from them. We already received the letter that, that they're going to be doing some work uh, in front of Ogden High and James Madison. I don't know exactly how that's going to work. I'm thinking they're going to come up 30th with it. Uh, so it, if they do something with Ogden, it would probably be that north or that southwest corner somewhere. Um, and James Madison, if they go in front, or I don't know if they're going to go on the east of the school 20, or up the uh, south side 30. of the school on 26th. Zane, I can speak to that if you'd like. Okay, yeah. Ken. So the the plan is for it to run up 25th, so it would be on the 25th Street side of James Madison. And then when it gets up to Harrison Boulevard, uh, it will be the corner of 28th Street in Harrison is the area that they'll be looking at to uh, affect the the landscape there for for picking up and, and dropping off for the for the rapid transit bus and the idea is to run it up to weber state and kind of create a loop and so that so from downtown uh, ogden area up 25th over harrison and there's a little bit more to it but that's the basic premise of it thanks thanks kim 
You're welcome. So that's kind of way, because April 1st is today and we have a meeting scheduled for Monday. Uh, we haven't had a chance to meet before today. So anyway. Okay. Thank you. Um, student achievement. I, I think, Jen, you're on student achievement, correct? Pardon me. Yes, but I was not prepared. But uh, I don't think there was a meeting. Yeah. And I started thinking about it today that... I left all my notes home. This is... Um, this might not work as well, doing reports at work session. Yeah, because we haven't... We've already reported on yeah. what we did last time. Yeah, so we're... So like wow. policy and law, we meet the second Thursday. Mm -hmm. So you would wait in that space, right? So this is the first month to where yeah. it's a new format. So as we meet in committees uh, in the next couple of weeks, then you would report that first week in May mm -hmm. regarding um, regarding those efforts. A again, you'll have a more than likely a regular session yes. in between that uh, time, but uh, we can do that. Um, Assistant Superintendent Carpenter can speak to Student Achievement uh, Committee uh, this evening if you'd like. Um, but we could still also look at another time at that yeah. format and see uh, how it works with our work session and even adjust committee uh, meeting times, although and they're already we could, calendared. We may as well just finish up the school year like this and mm -hmm. see if it catches up. Yeah. So, Chad? Yeah, so we met on the 2nd of uh, March. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just briefly, uh, we met on the 2nd of March. Uh, a couple of the items we discussed uh, were the CTE new courses that uh, um, Christine Heslip uh, shared last week. Um, we discussed the International Baccalaureate updates um, and where we were headed, and then um, had a, a brief introduction and, and revisited um, the Polk Enrichment Program. Um, just kind of had some initial discussions around that, um, and those were the items we discussed in the Student Achievement Committee. Thanks. Um, we will not be meeting in policy and law. Usually we meet the second Thursday, but because next Thursday is the first day of our National School Board Association conference, we pushed our meeting to the following Tuesday on the 13th. So we'll be reporting in May on that meeting. So we didn't even need five minutes. <laughs> now we'll go back to the superintendent for keeping Ogden healthy update. All right. Thank you, Vice President. I uh, just wanted to bring the board um, some clarification and some attention to uh, recent public health orders and um, new legislation. So I'm going to present a screen here. And as it pulls up. Well, as we started the school year, and gratefully so, uh, we started the school year uh, under keeping Ogden healthy uh, was our plan, uh, reopening an assurances plan, and each school created a, a plan that uh, mirrored what uh, our keeping Ogden healthy processes, protocols, and procedures were that were and are in alignment with the Utah Department of Health, Utah State Board of Education, uh, um, and our own Weber Morgan Health Department here. And so just uh, there's been a few moving parts as of late and a little bit of confusion that I would like to at least address um, this evening as it pertains to a, a couple different items. Um, as we know, <clears throat> we um, public health orders and legislative updates uh, have been, the legislative updates is fairly recent per, you know, we just had a general session of the legislature and, and there's been a couple bills that were passed that effectively direct uh, or directly affect um, uh, public education and as you know public health orders uh, have changed from time to time based on the need and, and conditions in the community and our state as it plays to uh, COVID-19 and spread and transmission. So uh, by way of reminder our ongoing efforts uh, today we were constantly focusing still on sanit uh, sanitation 
hygiene, uh, our personal protective equipment, including masks. We still work on physical distancing to the greatest extent possible. CDC did come out with some new guidelines uh, that changed uh, from six feet to three feet. And, uh, and that really is, I, I think, in response to a nationwide effort to reopen schools. As I mentioned, Utah, we've been um, ahead of that and have been fortunate to offer in-person learning uh, since the beginning of our school year. And in our district, we've been able to do that five days a week without a reduction in the school day um, uh, or schedule. Uh, we've been focusing on student engagement across multiple platforms, of course, in person, hybrid uh, type learning experiences, and those that do want to participate online, we have a very robust uh, Ogden online program uh, for schooling as well. And then uh, we've not lost our focus on what does it mean in terms of well-being, not only for our students, but for our staff under these, uh, under these circumstances, uh, which have uh, been trying, and that ebbs and flows at times as you can imagine and have experienced. House Bill 294 in the Utah uh, Department of Health. Uh, House Bill 294 has created a little bit of confusion and that I will address this evening uh, in public education and what the expectations are. As you recall, this, this bill was uh, discussed and debated and passed, and recently signed into law by Governor Cox. And uh, part of that bill suggests that uh, masks are no longer a requirement in most public places. There are some parameters around that, uh, of course. Um, but the bill does stop short and does not um, apply that same um, latitude to remove the masks for public education. So the mask requirement stays in place for K-12. And this came about uh, largely a, a discussion between the legislature and public health officials. And uh, they both came into an agreement that public education really needs to keep the masks uh, and that requirement in place. And below are uh, four reasons why, uh, primary reasons, why they arrived at that conclusion. One, there's no uh, vaccine. Uh, for children under uh, 16. And the dissemination of that vaccine still has, has a long way to go to reach uh, the entirety of our population to the extent possible. Um, not every adult, while we celebrated with community nursing services, uh, the vaccine being administered uh, to our employees, not every employee uh, was able to participate or did participate of their own will uh, in that vaccine. Um, for those that uh, uh, as you recall, uh, one of the parameters around getting the vaccine is, is you couldn't have had COVID-19 uh, for 90 days prior to the vaccine. Well, we know we had employees that had had COVID-19 uh, beyond that, and so they're still waiting for their turn, so to speak, to get that vaccine. Um, children get sick from COVID, and, and they do have long-term effects, um, and it's, it's not to to engage in any, anything but some facts is uh, we know that there are different variants of COVID-19 already, one particularly coming out of um, uh, Britain, England, where it, it is a little, uh, it's, it's more highly contagious and uh, highly contagious among children. And then um, uh, children, of course, uh, may be asymptomatic and be able to transmit that illness to people at home. So those, those are the, the primary reasons why the legislature and the Utah Department of Health came together. They decided in House Bill 294 that they were not going to remove the mask mandate in this piece of legislation for public education. Um, and so as, as school districts, as superintendents, we engage the Utah Department of Health, the State Board of Education, the governor's office, so forth. And this was an email dated uh, March 27th uh, in response to an inquiry regarding the mask mandate uh, that I received from the U Department of Health. And it just makes it very clear. Um, and the capitals are, are as I received the email, uh, that capitalized text. But the mask requirements for K-12 schools remain in, remains in place until June 15th. Local officials, like a school board or city count or county council, do not have legal authority to end the school mask uh, requirement before this date. There is some confusion uh, among the community, as I mentioned, because of House Bill 294, because um, you know, there is some frustration with the COVID-19 protocols, and, and I, I sympathize with anyone uh, who, who may feel like you know, they've had enough of the, of the COVID-19 uh, restrictions. Uh, but at the end of the day, 
um, as we're looking at finishing the school year, we are almost there. We're so fortunate. We're nearly eight months into the school year. Uh, now's not the time, nor do we have the authority to bank your curricular activities. And now we're looking forward to graduation ceremonies, right? We are, we are so close um, to being able to, uh, to finish this year out. And um, uh, as, as mentioned, in different pockets of communities across the state, uh, there's, there's more of an organized effort to, to rally or to protest that schools and boards remove the mask mandate. I just, I just can't state clear, clearly enough here that we simply do not have the authority to do that. And I'll go into that in just a little bit more. But uh, as we understand, uh, public health orders uh, have the effect of law. <clears throat> And Health Order 2021-2 uh, clearly specifies that for until June 15th, um, each individual on school property or on a school bus shall wear a face mask. That's language lifted directly from the public health order. There are exceptions to when on school property a mask be, be removed. And we don't overinterpret, I'll put it this way, we do not overinterpret public health orders and say we're going to add additional requirements other than those that are stated in a public health order uh, or in legislation. And so uh, an athlete can remove their mask, right? We've been playing basketball, volleyball, I mean, pick the sport, wrestling, we've been engaging in it. We've been able to do so safely. We administer the COVID-19 uh, uh, test to make sure that everyone's participating and they're, they're staying safe and keeping others healthy. Uh, so they are, they're able to remove their masks uh, for those conditions, under those conditions, but they're held to other conditions such as receiving a COVID-19 uh, test every two weeks. Um, students may remove masks while they're exercising or engaging in athletic training while outdoors or indoors and maintaining at least six feet of physical distance from any other individual. So this is high intensity exercise, right? Uh, again, you need to you know, be able to breathe at maximum occupant lung uh, capacity and be able to engage in those types of things, yeah. Um, uh, it is appropriate under those circumstances in that athletic training uh, to remove the mask. Of course, uh, bullet three, if there's a medical condition, a mental health condition, intellectual or devel developmental uh, condition that prevents a, a person from wearing a mask, we have a process uh, for, for parents, their, their students to identify that and receive an exception uh, to the fast, uh, face mask mandate. Of course, any student that has an IEP, that Individualized Education Program under the Individuals with Disability Education Act, uh, there's a process again to identify um, and make those exceptions uh, as, as they are needed. Uh, to continue, um, students may, while outdoors and maintaining at least six feet physical distance from any individual from a separate household, may remove their mask. Think of recess in the elementary space. If some kids want to play catch, they're kicking the ball around, they're maintaining six feet of distance, they can be at recess without their masks. If they're on, think of it this way, the playground equipment, the monkey bars, they're congregating in those spaces uh, and they're not able to maintain distance from, from their classmates, they need to have masks on. And our playground mounters, our schools, do a very good job in identifying how do we keep kids safe. There have been instances over the course of this school year where a student may have taken their mask off during recess. They were congregating with some other students. That student ends up uh, testing positive for COVID-19 and through the process of contact tracing, you have 15 plus other students who now have to go into quarantine um, for two weeks. Um, and so it's just, it's been critical that we follow uh, those expectations for when masks can be taken off and when they're not and in the event where they're taken off in a place where that exposes other children uh, per uh, Utah Department of Health and keeping Ogden healthy uh, protocols, uh, we've seen students that have had to go into quarantine, um, which is something we try to prevent, right? So, but it should be noted that during a recess, students may take it off if they maintain physical distancing. And that's been the case uh, as I speak with uh, other superintendent uh, colleagues, uh, same across across uh, districts in our state, per Public Health Order 2021-2. While actively eating or drinking, they can obviously they can remove their masks. This is think breakfast and lunch. Um, we offer both, and uh, they are able to remove it for those activities, of course. And uh, 
specialized services, uh, for example, speech therapy services, yes, a student uh, may be able to take off their mask in those conditions. So uh, Public Health Order 2021-2, as mentioned, it went into effect uh, January uh, 23rd of this year and expires June 15th, 2021, or until such time uh, that the Public Health Department, in conjunction with the governor's office, changes the Public Health Order. But to be clear, and to go back to earlier, uh, we have our, ourselves as as, a, as elected officials, as district administration, our schools, we're not able to uh, to change the mask mandate. We do not have that authority. Any questions on the public health order before I move on to Senate Bill 107? I, did, I have a quick question. Um, so as we are gearing up for summer bridge programs, do you think that'll become a district determination regarding mask or will we go back through health departments and well currently and and there's not been a timetable yeah. but i would imagine whatever the conditions are in the community or with COVID 19 and the spread there may be a new public health order that comes out that takes effect you know june 16th so to speak yeah. that would govern the conditions or the activities uh, on our campuses at that time um, there has there hasn't not been any lengthy discussion that we've been made uh, privy to that would allow boards to make that choice i will say if it does expire similar to let's say a business currently even though house bill 294 takes effect removing the mask mandate uh, across the state and public places individual businesses can still require masks um, that is that i mean that's that's something that they would be able to determine i'm just extrapolating and but require masks for summer bridge or summer learning activities um, but again that would more than likely like we've done uh, at the beginning engage our health department identifying what the transmission index is for for our area and make some determination together in in that space and the governor today did extend the mask mandate for all city employees or state employees state employees yeah yeah, yeah. through may yep yeah. I've got a question uh, on the, will we plan on sending a letter or an email to all parents stating this? We, we have uh, out of our communications office, uh, we just recently uh, in the last few days, um, um, Jer, I don't remember which day it went out on, but it was um, maybe Friday, actually. Last Friday this morning. Okay. Yep, uh, as a reminder. So we are we are communicating with parents because to that point, uh, there's been some confusion regarding it. And and even d despite some of the confusion with HB 294 there, you know, we've, we've heard from some that are just, you know, we're, we're having a hard time still doing, yeah, we've had it up, you know, with COVID-19 protocols and um, and then there's some frustration there. So we just want to make sure that they all understand uh, our parents, our community. Uh, one, how grateful it is that we, we've been able to keep schools open as long as we have in the way that we have. Uh, but two, uh, we just need to finish the year strong uh, with the protocols that we have in place. And we really don't have the authority to uh, deviate from that course of action. So we are communicating that out. Uh, schools will be posting. Uh, there's some posters uh, coming out of the uh, the Utah Department of Health uh, to help remind people uh, there will be something of a media blitz uh, coming out of the Utah Department of Health and, and possibly the governor's office to help remind people that such is the case in public education, uh, just to create that awareness um, that uh, what got us here needs to carry us through uh, the rest of the school year. So definitely from our, through our channels, and you'll see a larger effort uh, across state channels uh, to bring that awareness. Okay, Senate Bill 107, uh, this is in-person instruction prioritization. Uh, we had a, uh, a lot of involvement uh, with this particular bill. Um, essentially, it requires us to, to uh, engage in test-to-stay protocols in the event that a school reaches the case threshold. Now, a test-to-stay is just that, right? So if it, a school reaches the threshold, then we test the students, and we need parent permission to do that, right? So, but we test the students and uh, those that test negative are able to stay and we, in, for in-person instruction. Now, the threshold adjustments have been changed. 
um, the the uh, 14 day and the preceding 14 day requirement remains into effect. So anyone within 14 days uh, would count toward the threshold if they attended at least some in-person instruction at the school. Meaning, and there's been cases, right, as we've experienced over the course of this year where a student may have a member in their household who has COVID-19 and has not been attending school because they're in quarantine for having lived in that same household with someone. Now over the course of the, those 14 days, that child was not in our schools, but then they develop COVID-19 in their, in their own home. Previously, that student would count toward our case threshold, but they weren't in our schools, mind you. Right. So this particular piece of, of this legislation says, well, that person won't count anymore to your, your total because, well, frankly, they weren't at school. So we're excited to see that. Uh, they tested positive COVID-19 and they did not receive the student's positive COVID-19 test results through regular periodic testing required to participate. And again, sorry for the acronym, LEA, Local Education Agency or District Sponsored Athletic or another District Sponsored Extracurricular Activity. Meaning if we test uh, uh, girls softball and let's say two student athletes test positive, those two don't count toward the school's threshold. They count in terms of what, and through the process of contact tracing, how it affects other members of the softball team, but doesn't count to the whole school uh, and the case threshold. And then, uh, or other uh, sponsored activities. So this is where the thresholds has been changed. As you recall, it was 15. If we had 15 students on any given campus, the school either had to go into school dismissal for a period of 10 days. It was two weeks earlier in the school year but 10 days. In this case, schools won't go into dismissal anymore. They would, we would do test to stay. The 15 threshold has been changed to 30 for schools with less than 1,500 students. So that's our schools. So our high schools approach the 1,500 number, but they would fall into 30. So there would need to be 30 active within 14 days. COVID cases among students and staff, whoever attends school in that case, uh, before we would have to administer a test to stay event. Um, and of course we can't test students who are under 18 that we don't have uh, parent permission. And uh, we can seek, so for an example, we could go out if we felt like, you know what, uh, this such and such school is up to 20 cases. We The trend is showing that they might hit 30. We could engage parents early and say, hey, we, we are seeking uh, permission to test your child uh, for COVID-19 in the event that we hit the threshold of 30. And so it just uh, says there we don't have to wait till we hit to 30 to get parent permission. Yeah. I have a question. Once we get the parent's permission, is it good for just that one time? So oh, it, it, for us, it would be for the rest of the year. Okay. Yeah, good question. So we don't have to get, get it every, every time, yeah. But that would be part of the communication of the parents. Uh, fortunately, we don't have any schools close to that threshold at all. We've been trending in such a wonderful and positive direction away from cases in our district and the number of students and staff that have had to be in, be in quarantine. Um, so under this uh, protocol, this bill, uh, I wouldn't anticipate unless, well, I'll just say this, speaking to our experience this past uh, school year, we've, we've not come close to having 30 at one site at one time. Uh, of course, we were dismissing closer to the, you know, that 15 mark anyway, but still even then after it was dismissed, uh, we we wouldn't approach 30. So it, uh, but in the event that we did, uh, we would do a test to, test to stay event and uh, we would engage in that process. Questions about Senate Bill 107? Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, we uh, the COVID-19 school manual, uh, again, this is uh, produced for us uh, by the Utah Department of Health. It's about 123 pages of regulation regarding how schools are to operate in a, a, a pandemic. And so uh, um, anytime that there's a change in legislation in that case, or there's a change in, in uh, public health orders, uh, this manual is updated. 
and we take that under advisement and include it in our own processes and procedures, as has happened uh, several times. Just recently, given the public health orders and recent legislation, it has changed. This is just a summary um, um, of things that have changed recently in uh, the COVID-19 school manual. Vaccinations do play a role and they do impact quarantine and testing protocols throughout the manual. So for an example, if a teacher has had both uh, doses of a vaccine and it's been two weeks after, if they're exposed by someone who's tested positive for COVID-19, they do not need to enter quarantine. Um, so that type of information is in there. Um, the second bullet there, uh, it goes into that a little bit more. Uh, if you have a coach, I'll say this on that second bullet. Uh, if you have a coach who's received a vaccination, um, they don't need to participate in test to play activities, right? So under, under the conditions uh, previous, uh, before the vaccine, uh, even coaches were getting tested to every two weeks to be able to maintain uh, their, their engagement with uh, those extracurricular activities. Um, there's language in there that's been added. Uh, we offer the antigen test. And if a student tests positive and they so desire, uh, they can get a PCR test, which is uh, a, a little more um, uh, intense of a test. A, a little more sensitive of a test. Uh, after they receive the 24 hours of positive antigen test, if they receive that and it comes back negative, they don't have to go into quarantine. Um, so it is just specifying that the PCR test uh, would be used after, if it's done for 24 hours after positive antigen test, uh, that uh, that applies. Um, and that next bullet follows up on that, right? So an antibody test or that antigen test can't be used to avoid or end quarantine or isolation. It actually it has to be the PCR test. Uh, UHSAA has updated their protocols and that's been added. Um, one time extracurricular events held indoors, that's been adjusted. So uh, think prom, uh, think school dances, think things like that. Um, if we were to engage in those, and we are planning on that, uh, still working on some dates and details, but uh, there is a requirement under the COVID-19 school manual that any that anyone that desires to participate, let's say in a dance, has to receive a COVID test 48 hours prior to the dance. Um, and so we're working with Utah Department of Health and scheduling those and, and hopefully getting some help in administering those tests. As you can imagine, administering a test to a student body uh, is no small feat. Um, we've had a lot of practice with it, doing uh, all things extracurricular testing, but this uh, the scale would be much larger. Um, so it goes into a little bit more clarification as to what that looks like. If the event's held outdoors, um, they don't have to get the test, but in all cases, they still have to wear masks. Um, so COVID-19 school manual goes into that as well. I have a question. Sure. Okay. If a um, 16-year-old, because they can get the vaccination and they get both vaccinations or the one, do they still have to test? So they have to test until they have had their two weeks after their second. Uh, so they dosed. do have to have a test, yeah. even if they've been vaccinated? If, if they don't, if they've had both doses and it's been two weeks after the last dose, then they wouldn't have to test, right? If they've just had one, mm -hmm. then they would have to still get tested if they've Unless had Unless they had the Johnson & Johnson. Right, and it does specify that in there as well, yeah. Yep. Great question. Um, I, I, there's just more language emphasizing uh, that coordination with the local health departments, uh, that we're following those, uh, those requirements and best practices. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as I just alluded to, um, um, these uh, testing resources in the event that we need to engage in a, a one-time extracurricular testing event or a test-to-stay protocol uh, that we're able to uh, engage with Utah Department of Health for, for those resources. Um, and they've been very responsive uh, when, when we're engaging in that. Questions about the COVID-19 school manual? 123 pages. Last week, we briefly talked about the school dances and if someone comes in from another school district. Mm -hmm. um, this is a statewide policy, but um, how will Ogden High or Ben Lomond High know that a student's 
yeah. and tested 48 hours ahead. And for that reason, we're, we're not able to in, in that regard. And so uh, these dances are primarily to the, to the, to the benefit and the enjoyment of, of our students, of, of our students. Okay. Yeah, on our campuses. Uh, because some of that obviously is, is outside of our control, if they are outside of our district or, or what have you. Uh, we, you know, to verify that they've received a test requires some documentation and, and some extra things. Uh, and our, our high school administrators informing our students that this is a dis, these are district dances? Yes. Okay. Yep, yep. Good. Yep. Yes. Um, so then our own students will have like a little card or something? Yeah, so there's there's an app uh, that we've been using uh, in partnership with Utah Department of Health. Um, and so we have on, on our files with Utah Department of Health access to pull up any student at any time to determine whether or not they've received it. Now, like I said, there's an app. We're not for forcing students to put an app on their phone, but there is an app and they're able to show it and actually has a QR code and they're, you know, and they're able to say, yep, I've been tested that way. If they don't have that on their app, doesn't mean they can't, or on their phone, you know, we're, we're not in the business to tell, you know, students what they can and they can't have it on their phone, but in that respect. So, so, but it's voluntary. If they want to put on, on their phone, they could. Um, there's an app for that, but uh, if not, uh, we, we have a um, database. Again, it's, it's operated by the Utah Department of Health that allows us just to look at our students uh, to protect all those FERPA yeah. and HIPAA laws. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Good. Uh, this is one of those posters, finish strong with your mask on. Um, any, any questions, any clarifying questions? I know there's been a couple uh, emails from some concerned patrons regarding masks, mask mandates. Um, uh, we just want to make sure that a couple things. One, we we sympathize, we empathize uh, with with families and, and our students. Where you know we, it's been a very different year for all of us and very challenging in, in many many ways. Uh, and at the same time, though, uh, while we appreciate those concerns, uh, like wearing masks, uh, we're not in a position to lift that one. Uh, but two, uh, we're confident though that we're able to finish strong, still engage in. Uh, these extracurricular activities and, uh, and for the time being until such time where, again, the governor's office or the Utah Department of Health or if the legislature pulled a special session and changed something, uh, we are required to follow uh, the law. And uh, since we are a community uh, and a citizenship that uh, operates under the rule of law, um, now is not the time to depart from, from that. Um, there is a process for getting laws changed or those things like a public health order that has the effect of law. Um, there's ways to engage the Utah Department of Health for those citizens that are interested uh, or the governor's office. Uh, but of ourselves, oh, obviously we're willing to engage uh, with our, our families uh, to identify what resource opportunities may exist. Um, but at the end of the day, we are beholden to uh, the law of the land and at the moment when it pertains to masks, so we are required and will require our students and staff and patrons uh, to, to wear masks when on school property or on our buses. Um, just to show you just a couple of things, resources um, that we intend to circulate as well. If I were to pull up just a moment. Uh, just a synopsis, really, of uh, what will be circulated. And uh, this is this is one. Masks are still required in school throughout the end of the school year. This just goes into House Bill uh, 294, the mask requirements put in place, that we do not have the legal authority to end the mask requirement in school, the reasons why. And uh, as, as it, it goes into some information there that we're planning in-person proms, activities, graduations, um, and, and a, a plug there as to why we should still do it. It's also available in Spanish, and we'll circulate that accordingly as well. Uh, we have uh, mask posters. Uh, please respect our mask policy. Uh, given the, what our, our schools, our administrators, our teachers, our staff have, have been engaging in and doing, they've been doing hard work this year. Uh, we certainly uh, would not like to uh, make that any more challenging or difficult in, in the event uh, where 
efforts to take off the masks would come into play or be played out in the classroom. Uh, thanks for your respect. And just, uh, just some general masks are still the rule at school. Again, grateful for the Utah Department of Health for, for helping provide re some resources uh, to help communicate this message. Finish strong with your mask on and so forth. Right. Any, that's my report on keeping Ogden healthy, unless there are further questions or, or concerns that I could address for, it, for the It board. was nice to see Betsy Coleman's email showing every county is out of high. So encouraging. Um, levels, yeah. Yeah, that that is a welcome sight. And as I mentioned before, we're for the first time in a long time, I had pulled up the active COVID cases, and it was great to see that there wasn't any staff across the district that... Uh, Good had a positive case it's uh it's, we have a few right now i mean we're not out of the clear on this we have a few and we have uh some students as well uh, who have tested positive for COVID 19. i mean currently um uh, i pull it up again one moment so we have uh about 13 uh COVID positive cases across the district which by percentage is still significantly small mm -hmm. small but it's still any is too many um and uh and uh, and we'll still work to uh, prevent that and adhere to our, our protocols. But uh, as far as COVID positive staff, um, as mentioned, well, we have we have four staff um, in that space, and uh, and that's part of the thirteen. Yes. Yeah, and those are spread across some mm -hmm. schools, but uh, we monitor uh, our data daily uh, to make sure that. Uh, that we're engaging in safe practices and procedures and even contact tracing, right? So for an example, a student or staff is, is positive for COVID-19. We identify with the health department, who were they around, who might not be exposed, and then we make those phone calls accordingly. Well, thank you for that update. Thank you. Some good news too. So I guess we need to go into a closed session. Is that correct? So we need a motion to go into closed session. Thank you, Susan, and a second. I'll second that. Thank you, Amber. So we'll do a voice vote. Doug? Yes. 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 And Arlene stepped out for a minute. Those that will be present, all members of the board, superintendent, business administrator, Paula, and assistant superintendent, is that correct? Um, it's, or, that's not necessary. I mean, you're more oh, welcome to stay, okay. but it's. And that's it. Okay, you can take uh, five minutes. Get ready for the meeting. <clears throat> 